Let's see, the last time I saw everybody here, we finished talking about the story of the people of God and where we end in the sweet by and by. And now we're gonna talk tonight about the way and what it's like and how we are set up to live in the nasty now and now. And we're gonna take a look at the difference between wisdom and foolishness and how God has set us up. Wherever you grew up, I would bet that there's at least one person who was known as, shall we say, not so wise. The last thing you wanted to be around my neighborhood was the fool. Fools in our neighborhood in West Baltimore, where I grew up, always ended up with unfortunate nicknames, usually determined by the story that defined their foolishness. We had a guy named Bufus. We had a lady named Udi, and we had a young man whose nickname was Speed Bump. <laughs> How did Speed Bump get his nickname? Speed Bump was hanging outside of the hatchback of somebody's car, and he fell out. And the next car came and rolled over him. He got up, and he was fine, but from that day on, he was Speed Bump. <laughs> Back in Motown, there was a 70s groove, it was a bop, and it was a song that played on the radio, a group called The Main Ingredient, reminded us, now see, you don't have to necessarily be a believer, although someone in The Main Ingredient may have been, for all we know, but they captured our common humanity and our tendency towards foolishness with this song, everybody plays a fool sometimes. There's no exception to the rule, listen baby, it may be factual, it may be true, I ain't lying, everybody plays a fool. Then the band said, boop, 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 The last thing you wanted to be was a fool. Where then did foolishness come from? Before there was foolishness, there was wisdom. Let me unpack that for you. Proverbs tells us that by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place, and by his knowledge, the deeps were divided, and the clouds let drop the dew. So Christ created the universe by wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And Paul points out that the uncreated Christ himself is our wisdom in Corinthians. We can think of wisdom then with an uppercase W. It's a person. It's Christ. And then the Bible also speaks of wisdom with a lowercase w, an asset created by Christ at the foundation of the world. And before we get to Proverbs 9, Proverbs 8 tells us that the Lord brought wisdom forth as the first of his works before the deeds of old, appointed before eternity, before the world began. So before God's let us makes and even before the let there be's, wisdom was. So it's helpful to think of wisdom both as a person, as Christ, and as an asset created by that person. And as we dwelt together with Christ in the garden, our first orientation was towards wisdom. Then Genesis, as we read it, it gives us a few more clues as to how foolishness came to be. The serpent convinced the woman that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree that had been forbidden by God, was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Desirable to make one wise. Then Romans 1, 18 tells us what happened to our wisdom. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Their foolish hearts hearts were darkened. 
Our first parents dwelled directly with wisdom in the form of Christ. They chose instead to dwell with foolishness. And the sad part of the story is that we as their children are oriented now towards foolishness and have to be reoriented towards wisdom. So wisdom and truth are two sides of the same coin and they're connected. And in the same way, foolishness and lies are two sides of the same coin and they're connected. The peace that comes by the application of wisdom was a gift to us from a loving father. And it's only possible through connection with the ultimate source of wisdom, the person of Christ. Well, wait a minute now. There are some people who don't know Christ and who follow other ways, and how did they tap into wisdom? They write books. They have wise things to say. That's true. How do they do that? They borrow it from God. It's his world, and he's so gracious that he lets them even operate under his wisdom. He's kind enough to let them borrow some of his wisdom to keep the world from absolute chaos. But their foolish hearts remain darkened like our first parents. You see, peace on earth and in our own hearts is a byproduct of the application of wisdom. For the first man and the first woman, it was a byproduct of intimate communion with the Father, ultimate wisdom, Christ in the garden. For us, it's a byproduct of the application of God's revealed word or ultimate wisdom in our lives. At creation, our first parents walked with Yahweh. Jesus was the creator and the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. And on the New Testament side, isn't it interesting that we're told that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all knowledge and wisdom. And yet, even though it was supposed to be our primary orientation in the garden, in this fallen world, wisdom, being wise, sometimes it frustrates us. Well, Solomon wrote a good deal of the wisdom books, and he said this in Ecclesiastes 1. He says, look, when I see look and listen in the Bible, it comes out like that, listen, <laughs> look. I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. In other words, the more you know, the harder it is to pretend you don't know. An animal lives in the circle of its instincts and its drives. Man, in the likeness of God, looks for meanings so that he can control and direct his instinctive desires. And it might be easier to drop down to an animal level, but even the dropout can't escape his shaping and the image of God on him. His conscience will prick him because he's a man or because she's a woman. And he will wonder questions that the animals cannot, questions of wisdom. Animals don't ask why, for what purpose? We are fallen beings who need the life and illumination that comes from God. So let's take a look at a particular stretch of Proverbs. And what's view in view in Proverbs 8 and 9 is the notion that in the nasty now and now, as you operate as people living in the kingdom of God, what's in view in Proverbs is the notion that when you seek wisdom, you seek God. Remember, Scripture frames wisdom both as a person and as an asset. And just like in the garden, we have two possible positions, folly and wisdom. One way that leads to death, the other which leads to life. And there's a contrast between wise and foolish choices, and the consequences of each, and the peace that we experience based on what we choose. That choice began in the garden, and it's laced throughout Scripture. Every choice that's made in Scripture, every story that you read, is a choice between wisdom that leads to life and foolishness that leads to death. 
Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 gives us a snapshot of the personal consequences of seeking wisdom. And keep what happened in the garden in mind as you listen to this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil and this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Now, if only a dumb and woman had listened to that, what would the world be like? Then in the following chapters, Proverbs outlines the application and benefits of wisdom to the specific areas of our lives in contrast to the consequences of foolishness. Interestingly, Proverbs 8 and 9 frame the created asset of wisdom in the feminine as well as her opposite force, foolishness. So what we have in view are two women, two houses, and two meals. Wisdom's house is built on seven pillars. As a matter of fact, since seven is a sacred and complete concept, the house where she dwells is the image of a peaceful world. Wisdom invites the simple, those who lack judgment. Folly. Folly's house is a mess. <laughs> I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in Folly's house, and yet I have to fight it. Folly parrots wisdom in her invitation, though. She stands out in the street as well. And just as the serpent parroted God in the garden, it's almost true. She says, come on into my house. You will not surely die. Over at Wisdom's house, she has maids. There's a spirit of community and cooperation. And, and the, ro the guests there are robust and full of life. Folly has no maids in her house. She has no attendants, and her guests are the dead. Where are my Walking Dead fans? I imagine that the dead are like that in Folly's house, decaying, still living, yet dying at the same time. Now, wisdom... Wisdom's planned out her meal. She knows when the biscuits are going to come out of the oven at the same time that the rice is done and the meat's not going to be burnt and it's going to be a perfect medium. Folly, the way she's described in her house, is undisciplined. Wisdom's way requires repentance and turning from your simple ways. Folly's way says, no transformation required. You don't have to change. Just stay dumb, stay stupid, stay foolish. Come on in my house. Points to, wisdom points to intimate knowledge of God as the doorway to wisdom and life. Folly's house has no knowledge of God, nor does she provide any. And wisdom, once her meal is finished, it turns out to be a sumptuous banquet in her house. The meat and the wine represent the good teaching of wisdom that'll be tasty and profitable and good for your health. And wine and meat, here we have the flesh and blood foreshadowed by Jesus in John 6, 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, Folly's meal not only is it bread and water, that's prison rations, right? It's bread and water, but it's stolen bread and water. She probably was over at Wisdom's house like, let me go and get some of this loaf of bread. It's not even hers. Proverbs 5, 15 through 16 says, drink water from your own cistern. And 3020 says, this is the way of the adulteress. She, wipes, she eats, wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Wisdom is open about her table. She says, come on in. Folly eats in secret. Wisdom offers lasting reward and folly's reward is temporary. It's like cotton candy. It's nice and fluffy in the package, but you put it in your mouth and bloop, it's gone just like that. It's interesting 
to me that scripture gives us two positions framed not in terms of externals, but in terms of an internal orientation, a woman who is wise, a man who is wise. And Proverbs gives us these orientations in the feminine. So they're kind of tied to the woman's choice in the garden. And in the Bible's viewpoint, you're either dwelling in the house of wisdom and you're dwelling in the house of folly. Now, the beautiful part is wisdom can be ours no matter what the externals of our lives. She holds out her invitation and calls to all to come to her house. Wisdom doesn't say if you're married, you'll be wise. She doesn't say if you're single, you'll be wise. She doesn't say have a quiver full of children, you'll be wise. She doesn't say if you're a man or if you're a woman or if you're old or if you're young. Mama used to say there's no fool like an old fool, right? Wisdom doesn't say if you're tall or short or white or black or Asian, you'll be wise. Get a PhD and you'll be wise. Wisdom is not based on externals. Wisdom simply says, come. And at any point in our time on earth, here in the nasty now and now, as we follow the way, we're either moving toward life or we're moving toward death. And Paul qualifies the foundation of these two poles by framing throughout Scripture, dead in Adam, alive in Christ. And he repeats it over and over and over again. Mama don't raise no fools, we used to say in our neighborhood. Divine wisdom was present at creation with Christ as the creative agent, and we dwelt together with wisdom. We were created by wisdom. Genesis 1, John 1, 1, Proverbs 3 through 8 all affirm this. And the shalom, the peace, the harmony that Christ instituted with Christ, with the creation of man, man's application of wisdom is the doorway to accessing and maintaining that peace. Well, that's wisdom in the nasty now and now as we follow the way. But where does wisdom take us? Now, y'all know by now, you've heard me speak a few times today, and you know I'm not going to leave you in the nasty now and now, because that's not where the story ends. Amen? Amen. Revelation 21 and 22 give us more clues about wisdom. And just like wisdom in Proverbs, oh, look, there's a shelter, a dwelling place, and there's a meal. Oh, glory. The dwelling place. Revelation 21 and 22 give us its scope in the best of human terms. It's grand. It's opulent. It's fortified with high and strong walls and no bad thing will come in. It's a safe place. It's a protected place. It's the place he's gone to prepare for us. You can talk back to me just as his lovingly created and prepared a place for us at creation. The meal is there. We have a banquet the marriage supper of the Lamb. The promise of the supper was so great, John the Revelator had to shout and fall down. The tree of life is there, 12 kinds of fruit. Have you ever been to DeKalb Farmer's Market in Atlanta? They have 12 different kinds of mushrooms. It's an enormous shopping place. One tree, 12 different fruits, and the leaves were for the nation's healing. And the Bible says we have a right to that tree of life now. We can come in through the gates, whereas in the old garden, we were barred by that flaming sword. Brava, brava. <laughs> Amen. Whether it was in the garden or in this side of the divide, in the nasty now and now, or in the sweet by and by of glory, know this. Our peace as inhabitants of the kingdom of God is built on wisdom's foundation. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. So one question as we walk through the nasty now and now, every time you are faced with a choice, ask yourself, ask God, ask each other, is this wise? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.